excited to be bringing you the first ever virtual PRC home tour this summer. Um, as you all, I'm sure know, um, this year's um, events have forced had forced us to cancel all of our spring events, or at least postpone them um, in the indefinite future. So we are um, testing out this virtual home tour model to uh, continue to bring you guys access to incredible historic New Orleans homes, um, even if you have to see them from your own living room. Um, so this is um, our first virtual fundraiser um, of this variety. We're really, really excited to be trying it out. Um, so please know uh, we are so grateful to all of you for, for being here for joining us um, for this class and or for this event and for all the classes that some of you have come to over the course of the past few months. Um, and we uh, hope that you'll be joining us for the rest of the summer for the other um, Shotgun House Tour events. So um, just so you know, this event, this uh, talk today with Katrina Horning of New Orleans Architecture Tours is going to kick off a series of Sundays where we'll actually get to see the homes that would have been on our traditional Shotgun House Tour in March had we been able to hold it. Um, so I want to give a quick shout out to our incredible sponsors. Um, Shotgun House Tour um, is presented by Entablature Design Build and Entablature Realty. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you to, um, to those companies for making this whole tour possible. Um, I also want to thank all of our other incredible sponsors, um, our wonderful event chairs, um, Cecily Bell, Caroline, Caroline Graham, and Mary Frances Parker of the Graham Bell Parker Group of Ladder and Bloom. Um, thank you for making this possible. Also, um, you, you guys really rocked and can kept the tour together. Um, thank you to Luzianne. Uh, Luzianne Tea is such a great sponsor of this event. And for those of you who came last year, we got to drink tea. And it's such a wonderful New Orleans thing to be able to drink wonderful sweet tea on someone's front porch. And while we can't do that, thank, Louisiana is incredible and we want you guys to know how much um, the PRC appreciates their support in all of this. Um, please consider buying some Louisiana tea and, and, and drinking it um, while you enjoy some of the future events if you don't have any today. Um, it's a wonderful way to, to do that. And in a second, I'll actually be sharing a cocktail uh, recipe with you guys that they shared with us um, to make uh, your tea drinking a little bit more spirited. Um, also, thank you to obviously New Orleans Architecture Tours. Katrina, thank you for supporting this event and for doing this, um, this talk today. Thank you to Zangara and Partners LLC, Hamilton Brothers Construction LLC, Hancock Whitney, um, Albert Architecture, Margaret Stewart, the Southern Animal Foundation, Atomic Architecture, Cypress Building Conservation, Orient Express, and Weeda Laudemi of um, Hill Riddle Jr. and Associates. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I also would like to just make a quick note that Hancock Whitney um, not only is supporting the Shotgun House Tour, but has signed on as the first bank to support the PRC's Revival Grants Program. So fundraisers like this and the sponsors and supporters that the PRC has uh, make possible our and all of our work, including our advocacy work, our wonderful um, award-winning preservation in print magazine, uh, the, the online free classes that we've been doing throughout the spring. Uh, and also uh, we launched last year a grant making program to provide critical home repairs for low to moderate income homeowners in full control historic districts. We launched the, the program in Treme and we have been able to help a number of homeowners this year um, to remediate the, viola the, the, the issues with their homes that um, had them in violation of um, HDLC rules. Um, we really believe so strongly at the PRC that historic preservation is for everyone and should be available to everyone. Um, and we want to make sure that we are part of making uh, preservation equitable and um, really uh, making it available so that the city can be enjoyed for, for all of our residents. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I would like to quickly show you this awesome cocktail recipe from Louisiana, um, so you guys can, can dream about making a wonderful drink and um, I'll be right back with you. Sorry, I don't know what happened. We'll try again.
All right. So thank you, everyone. We are, um, I know what I'll be drinking later this evening, um, for sure. Um, so, oh, sorry. Sorry. She wanted to show us one more video. Um, so, uh, again, thank you to our sponsors. Thank you to all, to all of you for being here today. Um, please note, as this is a fundraiser, we do have a suggested donation of $25. That is less than the in-person ticket for Shotgun House Tour would have been. So um, if, you, if you like what you see today, especially if you are considering or you do come to some of our other events on our Shotgun Sundays throughout the summer, um, please do consider making a donation to the Preservation Resource Center uh, so that we can continue this work, continue it, continue not only our programming, but like I said, our revival grants program, uh, our advocacy, we just saved, we just worked with um, legislators and the Historic Tax Credit Coalition to save the historic tax credit at the state level, um, which is an amazing economic development tool um, that makes the uh, adaptive reuse and renovation projects that you see all over the state possible. Um, so please help us keep doing that work. Um, and without further ado, we're all here to learn more about shotgun houses and um, enjoy some information about historic New Orleans. So Katrina Horning with New Orleans Architecture Tours, thank you for doing this um, and take it away. Thanks so much for having me. Um, are we to my PowerPoint? Not yet. Okay. So you'll click the, click the green button. Okay. That says share. Share. All right. And then we can get to your screen. PowerPoint. Perfect. All right. There we are. Wonderful. Oh. Well, thank you everybody for coming to learn about shotguns. I wish we were outside in front of shotguns discussing them, but this is the best we can do right now. I'm really excited that the PRC asked me to talk about houses because at this point I just need to. Um, so I live in a shotgun house. This is my little house and I love it so much. This is a neoclassical double shotgun. And if you're not sure what all that really means, um, we're going to go through it all, and by the end of the tour, you'll be able to say she lives in a neoclassical double shotgun. So let's start with what is a shotgun exactly? Um, basically, in its most general sense, a shotgun is one room wide with four to six rooms back. It's a long, narrow house. It doesn't have any interior hallways. It doesn't have interior stairwells. They're just simple constructions. The origin of um, shotgun houses is kind of shrouded in mystery. We think that perhaps they were brought from Africa through Haiti to New Orleans. Now in 1809, 10,000 Haitian refugees showed up here and they brought with them different building styles and one of them is a shotgun. Um, when they showed up, there's 10,000 people and so they needed a quick way to build houses for all these folks. And so what better way than simple rows of rooms all connected by doorways. Um, as various immigrants moved into the city after the Haitians, we have Italians, we have Irish, we have Germans. They went with this housing style as well. And so you won't find them just in the areas where Haitians settled, but you'll find them all over New Orleans. As they, basically they came to New Orleans and then as they got out, um, you know, the housing style moved out and it went all over the Gulf Coast. It went all the way up uh, to the Northern states as well. You'll find shotguns everywhere. Now we gotta talk about um, why it's called a shotgun. There's two reasons. One, it's called a shotgun because you can fire a gun from the front door to the back door. All the interior doors line up. That's a lot of fun. Also, <laughs> it's called a shotgun because of the word togun, which is an African word to mean house. Now, one of the reasons why they took off here in New Orleans was because they are very good for our hot subtropical climate. Um, all the doors line up to create a great chance for airflow in the hot summer. We have tall ceilings inside, 10, 16 foot high ceilings. Heat rises, so you're gonna want that heat up at the roof, you know, up at the ceiling line, not down where you're sitting. Um, we have floor to ceiling windows in a lot of these buildings. Um, they're raised up on brick piers, and you can see that here in this picture. Um, if you notice, we have uh, cement piers, and then you have a little lattice work. 
that's going to allow for as much airflow as possible underneath this house. Inside the house, you're not going to have insulation, you're not going to have subfloors, and that's going to allow for as much airflow as possible. So these houses are really, really good at a time when we don't have air conditioning, when breezes are the key. If you can find them in August, there's no breezes. And now we got to talk about types and styles. So I want to show you guys first what isn't a shotgun. All right, so types is the general layout of the building, the floor plan, if you will, and then styles are the decorative features that are placed over types. So with many of these styles, you will find them overlaid over different types. They're sort of mix and match. So what isn't a shotgun? Creole townhouses are not shotguns. They're a few stories. They're built largely after the fire of 1788. Um, they have French and Spanish influences. Um, they have a commercial first floor with apartments up on top. And uh, some of the special features of Creole townhouses include port cachers, which are carriageways, which will bring you um, back to the courtyard, or entresols. So if you look at the picture on the left, we have a great example of an entresol. An entresol is a little storage area, a mezzanine, in between the first story and the second story. So you're going to find those on Creole townhouses. Be sure to notice the floor plan here. Um, if you look at the first floor plan, there's like a long hallway. That's actually a port cachere. So you could have brought um, a carriage in there. Then we have center hall cottages, or excuse me. Then we have double gallery houses. And double, double gallery houses you're going to find more around the American areas. They don't have commercial down below. They are strictly residential buildings. They have very prominent front doors. Um, you're going to find interior hallways. That's going to be an American feature. We're going to talk about that again in a moment. Um, notice the layout, of course. Now you have interior hallways and interior stairwells. Notice we have two different styles here. So even though the floor plan would be the same, they have different decoration. Then we have center hall cottages. And center hall cottages are really easy to tell. There are five bays, that means there's five openings across the front, and the center bay is going to be a door. Behind that door is a hallway. Be sure to note this layout here. We have a hallway right in the middle that goes to the back stairs. Um, sometimes they go right through, there's no back stairs at all, they go right through the back door, which is going to be good for airflow too. Um, hallways are a major difference between American and Creole architecture. So Americans, um, they really prize privacy. And so you're going to find a lot of hallways in their construction. The Creole construction, the French and Spanish construction, uh, they typically wanted to use every inch of space as, efficiency as, as efficient as possible. And so they didn't really like to waste space with interior stairwells and uh, interior hallways. Then we have Creole cottages. Gosh, these are super cute. Um, Creole cottages are one and a half stories tall. They're four rooms. So there are two rooms in the front by two rooms in the back. This is a square building. Um, no hallways. See, every room opens up into each other. They are not great for privacy. Um, in many cases, behind this house, you'll have a courtyard and then a dependency. And a dependency is an outbuilding, you know, a building that supports the main building. Now we get to talk about shotgun types. So we just talked about all the non-shotgun types. And now we have shotgun types. First, single shotguns. Single shotguns are pretty easy to figure out. They have two bays. They got a door and a window in the front. They're one room wide, five or six rooms back, four, five to six rooms back, no hallways typically. They are super, super cute. Look at this layout here. You're not going to have a lot of privacy in these. Um, if you want to look at these and think about where you put bedrooms, they're a little tricky. We have a couple variations on the single. Um, on the left hand side, we have the side hall. And the side hall uh, is kind of how you get around not having hallways. Um, these have hallways included in them, and all of the rooms open up as you go down the hall. On the left hand, uh, excuse me, on the right hand side, we have a side gallery, the elusive side gallery. Um, I only know of a couple of these, um, but they are really, really neat because they have the uh, hallway running on the outside of the house. So if you look at the picture on the right hand side, you can kind of see in the um, transom there that it's, it's all light. It's actually outside. So if you open up that door, 
you'd still be standing outside, which I think is generally kind of fun, like a little trick. Sometimes they have doors, sometimes they don't. And then we have doubles. Doubles are really easy. They are, um, you know, two apartments side by side. They run linearly. These are long rectangular buildings. Um, notice all the different styles with them. You can put any kind of style on any kind of shotgun. I think that's super important to keep in mind. Um, now, when these were built, they were typically built for two different families. You know, they would be apartments. But these days, you know, people have decided that they need more space. You know, maybe you need a bedroom for every kid you have. Um, and so, in a lot of cases, double shotguns are being taken over and converted to become single shotguns. Um, it's kind of interesting. The way you can tell is the mailboxes and the, and the house numbers. So if it has two, house, uh, two uh, mailboxes, it's probably still a double, but if they've removed one of the mailboxes, it's probably being converted into a single. Now this is really important stuff, guys. I think it's, oh, we're gonna mention this a couple times because it's really important. Four bay shotguns, look like Creole cottages. And so sometimes it's really hard to figure these out. I mean, I have time, I have trouble figuring them out myself. Um, both of them have four bays. Both of them have four openings in the front, two doors, two windows. The best way to tell is the way of looking at the roof line. So if you notice with the um, double shotgun on the left, we have a gabled roof, which means it does this right in the front and you can see it. And then the Creole cottage, the roof slopes towards the sidewalk. So do keep that in mind. We're gonna talk about this again, like right now. Um, here we have two houses right next to each other. They look very, very much the same. Can you tell the difference? We have a Creole cottage on the left. We have a double shotgun on the right. And they're both basically dressed the same. Another way you can tell if the roof line isn't enough of a trick for you, look at the side here. Um, on the, the blue house, you can see that it's a square house. It's a Creole cottage. It's got two rooms in the front, two rooms in the back. It goes one and a half stories tall. So the roof line is gonna be so handy with these things. The shotgun, of course, is a long linear building. I like to tell my guests, you know, Creole cottages are squares, shotguns are rectangles. And that's what helps me remember. And then we have camelbacks. Camelbacks are super fun. Um, I just like to imagine someone bought a house and then they ran out of space and they're like, oh gosh, where can we go? Let's go up. And so they did. Um, sometimes they're built on, sometimes they're original to the building. Um, there's no rhyme or reason for them in, in that, or rather there's no like designated plan. You know, sometimes it's two rooms at the top. Sometimes it's one room at the top. Um, it's very interesting. I think camelbacks are really neat. And I think their name is really clever. I mean, it looks like a camel hump. Anyway, moving on. Now we've got to talk about shotgun styles. So one of the great things about shotguns is how easy it is to change their style. So they're built in New Orleans from 1820s all the way to the 1940s. So they're decorated with whatever the style of the day was. Um, do keep in mind that house styles are exactly like clothing styles, right? Um, every style is either a reaction to what came before it or builds on it. Um, and we're going to talk about that. We also like to cycle back to things we liked two generations ago. So I sort of think of it like we kind of react to our mom's style, but we really like our grandma's style. Um, think of how many times bell bottoms keeps coming back. You know, it's that kind of thing. Um, anyway. So first, we got Greek Revival. You know, generally, Greek Revival is, is very, very boxy and plain. It runs 1830s, 1850s. Um, the reason why Greek Revival took off in the United States the way it did was because we, um, you know, when the United States was founded, it was a democracy. And so we started looking back to the greatest democracy. And who's that but Greece? And so we started copying their architecture. I mean, maybe with the hopes that we would become, you know, as great as Greece. So major features include, um, notice this door here. This is called a Greek key door or a cross-headed door. Um, they're really neat. And I feel like this is one of those details that once you learn about it, you can't unsee it. Um, so that's called a Greek key door. Keep an eye out for that. It's really important. Then we have dentals. Those are those little squares that run along the roof line there. Those are great little decorations. Um, 
you have boxy columns. Sometimes you'll have a wooden railing with little wooden slats. Um, but overall, this is a very, very boxy plain style. Here's another great example of Greek Revival. Look at these door frames and the window frames. They're so neat. Then we have Italianate. And Italianate is the reaction to Greek Revival. You know, we've done Greek Revival 20, 30 years, and people get bored of it. The homeowners get bored, the architects get bored, everyone's bored. And so they need to do something new. And so they start adding curves. You know, they're inspired by Italy now. So they were inspired by Greece. Now they're inspired by Italian villas. So they want to sort of um, copy that a little bit. They want to show that they've been to Europe, you know. They want to show that they're educated in these things. So anyway, we start getting arches. You notice that here we have ironwork. We have parapets. If you notice that piece on the roof line that sort of looks triangular. Um, you know, we, uh, we had a lot of these pieces started coming out of catalogs. You know, you'd have millwork catalogs, you'd have ironwork catalogs. We were mail ordering things from New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore. Um, you know, it's, it's really, and there was a lot of trade with the Northeast at this time. Now, do keep this in mind. We do have a lot of Greek Revival Italianate transitions. It's really hard to find. I mean, I'm not even sure that I know of a full uh, Italianate, um, Italianate shotgun because this one has the boxy columns of Greek Revival. This one also has um, the square windows. These are all different mixes of the same Greek Revival Italianate. So notice the arches, notice the coins. Those are those little squares uh, decorating the sides of the shotgun on the picture on the left-hand side. Those those are coins that spell Q-U-O-I-N-S. We want to start adding some texture. The one on the left is dentals. That's Greek Revival. The one on the right also has dentals. Um, so there's just some things to uh, look at. We have a lot of Greek Revival Italianate transitions. Then we get into East Lake style. Um, East Lake style runs 1880s to 1905. It started by Charles East Lake, who was a furniture maker. He wrote a book called Hints on Household Taste and Furniture, Upholstery and Other Details. It's a book about furniture design. This was, uh, you know, his plan was that it should be a handcrafted movement. Um, he was really upset that we were making everything out of, you know, with machinery. And so he wanted to sort of turn back to a handcrafted movement. Um, and this started in England. He started this in England. And then as it came across the United States, as uh, it became very popular, people started using machines to make these pieces. It w and this really irritated him. Um, I have a little quote for him. He says, I find American tradesmen continually advertising what they are pleased to call East Lake furniture, the production of which I have had nothing whatever to do, and for the taste of which I should be very sorry to be considered responsible. So he really hated this style. I think they're great. <laughs> uh, personally, I really love the East Lake style. They really remind me of like dollhouses. You know, we have spindles, we have stained glass. If you notice in the gables, uh, we have some fish scale shingles, all that texture there. Um, we have some really, really fun stuff. Notice the color on the one on the bottom. I love it. Then we have the bracket style. Bracket style is also referred to as New Orleans millwork style and uh, Victorian Italianate style. Um, you're gonna find that it's got some Queen Anne sort of features, you know, some textures, some fish scale shingles. It's going to have the brackets though. So do you notice I included these little brackets down here on the bottom. Um, that, that's really the hallmark of this style, of course. It's not just the name, it's the thing. Um, I included this picture with all the orange on it um, because I, I find it really interesting. This was a double shotgun, a bracketed double shotgun that was lifted to uh, create this two-story building now. And I just think it's kind of interesting. Do notice the great stained glass, it looks like cranes. We have sunburst patterns up there with the crane windows. We have arched windows, which is again, sort of an Italianate feature. We have the coins that are Italianate. So we have little things sort of coming together. Uh, beware, guys. I can't stress this enough. Uh, a lot of times, 
brackets were used to update Creole cottages. So you might have a house, a Creole cottage that was built in the 1790s, and then in the 1890s, they put these brackets up. And I just think it's super fun. People like their houses to look modern. So uh, keep an eye out for these. It's not a bracketed shotgun, it's a bracketed Creole cottage. It's really strange. Now we have neoclassical, right? So neoclassical is a reaction to the busyness of, um, you know, Queen Anne and Eastlake and Bracket. Um, people just get to a point where they're like, we cannot add anything else to these houses. So in order to be special and different, we have to simplify. So this, um, what was boxy and simple? You know, Greek revival. So they start, they start making a, a new style that's really, um, you know, we don't want to copy Greek Revival, we want to suggest it, you know. So we do have some new stuff. We have these prismatic windows. We have, um, the doors are a little different. We don't have dentals, but we do have some columns. So you might look at this house and be like, looks like Greek Revival, but some things are a little wrong with it, you know, and that's because it's not as plain as Greek Revival would have been. Um, and it, Greek Revival would have had dentals, of course. In a lot of cases, you're going to have neoclassical columns are Roman columns instead of Greek Revival columns. So they're not going to be fluted. They're not going to have all those lines that go vertically down them. Um, those are more Roman style. And this style, by the way, started with the uh, Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 1893. Um, and then it spread all over, all over the United States. Neoclassical was the style of public buildings, private buildings, it was everywhere. Here's another great example of neoclassical. So this one, you look at it and you're like, well, it's got columns like Greek Revival, okay, but it also has fan lights, it's got arches. That's not right. Um, those swag decorations, um, those blue pieces that you see um, painted, those are also not, they, they don't really work with Greek Revival, it's too decorative. And then we have California and craftsman styles. Um, so this is another reaction to all the busyness and the texture of um, Queen Anne and East Lake and all that. But instead of looking backwards, like neoclassical did, this is a brand new style, kind of out of nowhere. Um, it started in uh, California, in Pasadena, California, by Charles and Henry Green, and then it spread it out from spread out from California. Um, you know, at this time, Hollywood's getting going, we're really excited about California things. And so they really took off here. We're building new suburbs. This one's in the Irish Channel, but you're gonna find a lot of craftsman stuff in the new suburbs, you know, Gentilly and in places sort of out of the historic core. Now, major features include the tapered columns, overhangs with exposed rafter tails. So if you notice here, we're sort of getting away from hiding the bones of buildings. We're sort of showing them off. Um, and then on this one, we have this Japanese inspired gabled window. Simple lines are the hallmark of that last style. So shotgun houses are an excellent example of housing that sprang up as a result of the needs of the city's growing immigrant populace. They're quick to build, they were cheap, they worked well with our hot sub subtropical climate, and as time went on, however, our feelings changed about them. With no hallways, they lack privacy. As a single-story building, they're really small. With tall ceilings and no insulation, they were not energy efficient. People abandoned shotguns, preferring larger homes with modern amenities. Even worse, many shotguns have been demolished to make room for new construction. We have lost so many of these little houses. Um, this house on this slide is the former home of Buddy Bolden, the father of jazz. Um, it's been largely abandoned for decades, but in the past year, efforts have been made to restore it into a museum to showcase the life of Buddy Bolden. So from these humble little houses, amazing things were accomplished. I mean, jazz music. So I'd like to remind you that every building tells a story. They're all important, even little tiny cute ones. So after this little talk, do you think you know shotguns? I created a little quiz for you guys, and I'll give you some time to sort of mull them over. Here's the first one, super cute, it's pink. 
the picket fence is fantastic. I wish I had a way to ask you all what it was. Um, so I'll just tell you, it is a side hall single, East Lake style, of course. We have this beautiful spindle work. We have the textured gable. We have some stained glass up there. Notice all the beautiful um, decorations over the windows and doors. Um, some great millwork there. If it's got fanciful millwork, it's East Lake all the time. Then this one's gotta be easy. This is a, of course, this is of course a bracketed shotgun. This appears to be a double that was converted into a single. Now this one's tricky. We've got two houses here. The one on the right is um, of course a Creole cottage. If you notice, it's a square. It's got the roof that heads down towards the sidewalk. It's like half of a Creole cottage. Very interesting. And then of course the one on the left here would be a single camelback bracketed, or excuse me, uh, excuse me, bracketed single camelback shotgun. It's a mouthful. And then this one, of course, is our Creole cottage pretending to be a bracketed shotgun. I hope you guys all enjoyed this little talk. Please be sure to check us out on uh, nolatours.com. Uh, we have Instagram, we have Facebook. Um, when we're not all hunkered down, we're out doing tours. So I'd love to see you all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Katrina. That was fantastic. Um, we would love to um, take some questions um, for anyone who would like to um, get any clarity on anything or dig a little bit deeper. Um, please feel free to write your questions in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can click that and send us a question. I will read them aloud to Katrina so we can learn a little bit more. Um, so send, send them in if you'd like to. Uh, in the meantime, Katrina, maybe, um, can you tell us a little bit more about um, the neighborhoods that shotguns are found in? Do you, do you um, have any more information, sort of like when you go out on tour, oh, sure. what neighborhoods would you find a lot of shotguns in and, and why? Well, you know what, you're going to find shotguns in every single neighborhood. So it's really interesting because like even like even in the garden district, when I'm doing my tour, there's a few shotguns on the tour. And it's because there were bigger lots at one time. And then as the people that owned, I mean, it was full quarter block lots. So as time went on, as people decided, oh, we have some land we can sell, shotguns are perfect houses to just slip in these spaces. And so right on Washington Avenue, we're talking about, you know, center hall cottages, and then there's these great single shotguns right there just slipped in. Um, so you'll find them even in the fanciest neighborhoods. They're great. Uh, someone is also asking um, where you would find the, a majority or a high proportion of Greek revival shotguns specifically. Do you know what neighborhoods um, that oh, might be? Sure. Um, so you want to sort of think about what neighborhoods were being settled as that style was happening. So that style runs basically from 1830s to 1850s. So you're not gonna really find them in Gentilly. You know, you're not gonna find them um, in Lakeview, um, but you will find them along the Mississippi River because that's where we were, um, you know, that's where we were settling at that time. Be, be on the lookout for the ones that are pretending. You know, <laughs> you might find a 1950s one that look Greek revival. Um, there's that too, it's, it's tricky sometimes. Um, do you have any estimate for how many shotgun homes um, are standing in New Orleans um, in total? Is that something that there's a count on? You know, I've never even thought to look at that. Um, that would be a really interesting thing. Um, no, I, I don't know. I just, 
yeah, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't even know how to check, how to look that up, but now I'm going to have to. I'm <laughs> glad for the question. <laughs> That'll give me something new to research. Well, I will say there's, uh, there's a scholar um, at LSU um, who it, I believe is, is in the process of writing a book on shotguns. So I bet he's going to, he's going to be having that answer. And obviously the, the oh, peer is awesome. in touch with him as, as that project comes along, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we'll we'll find out. Um, well, I can't wait. That's awesome. <laughs> um, Katrina, can you tell us a little bit more about um, uh, whether or not shotgun houses were a common architectural type um, or a prevalent architectural type um, among the community of free people of color in New Orleans? Well, that's. I mean, that's what we're guessing. Because um, you know, generally the, the theory is is that it was brought from Africa, you know, where they have to deal with heat as well, you know. So it's it's really a very it's so important for hot climates. And then it's brought to Haiti, and then there's, you know, many people that came from Haiti. The Haitian Revolution brought us ten thousand Haitian refugees. Those were free people of color and enslaved people. And so when they brought this with them. Um, you had free people of color that were building their own houses. So you will find them in the Marigny, you'll find them in the Bywater, you'll find them um, where free people of color settled. And then, I mean, I just get the impression that, um, you know, as these houses are being built, because they are so easy to build and so good with our climate, that um, they just spread really quickly. I mean, you'll find them, uh, you know, on the Creole side and the American side, you know, at the same time. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm gonna try to get this question right. And so to the person who asked this, if, I, if I'm mixing this up, please let me know. Um, they're asking about, if you can, can elaborate a little bit more on shotgun houses where the, 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 um, the doors don't line up. So um, we've all seen them. You walk into a shotgun house and sort of the, the doorways switch back the and forth. The doors don't line up, yeah. I mean, it's it's really a conundrum to me because it's called a shotgun because the doors line up, but I've lived in a couple where the doors don't line up. And so it's kind of an interesting thing and I'm not sure why that would be um, because then you wouldn't, you wouldn't call it a shotgun if that wasn't the point. Um, so yeah, no, I, I know there's plenty of houses where the doors don't line up. I mean, I want to, I want to sort of say that there's maybe that's the variance, you know, like it's supposed to be that way. I mean, maybe it's a, a single versus double thing because the doubles that I've lived in, the doors didn't line up. I don't know now. Now, <laughs> all you nice people that live in shotguns, let me into your house so I can see. <laughs> We've got a, a vocabulary question here. Um, someone is asking what um, what uh, what is the other word that is used to describe brackets. Sometimes people call them corbels, C-O-R-B-E-L-S. Um, there are a lot of different words for all the different things that decorate that space there. So you have dentals, you have medallions, you have corbels, you have brackets. My understanding is that brackets are wood and corbels are masonry. So if you look at, um, and my best example for this would be uh, the Morris Israel House in the Garden District they have masonry corbels, whereas the brackets are wooden, they're millwork. Great. Um, we have a lot of questions, so I just, we're gonna try to get to as many of them as we can, but I'm reading through some of them now to see what, um, see what sort of flows next. Um, so, um, a few people, just so you know, a few people have been asking if we're going to see the interiors of shotgun houses. So I just want to let you know that um, the way we've set up shotgun house tour this summer, um, the next few weeks, um, starting next Sunday, July 12th, we'll be featuring a different house each week. So next week, um, we'll be seeing the home of Michelle Duvall, um, a wonderful renovation by Entablature Design Build. Um, and so you'll be able to see the interior of that house and we'll tour around. We'll have, and then each subsequent Sunday um, throughout July and August, we will see the interior of a different house and be able to talk to the homeowner um, about their, their home, their renovation, their art, the same as you would see on a tour. Um, so stay tuned for that or, or, or tune back in for that in the coming weeks. 
Um, this was sort of an intro so that uh, people who wanted to familiarize themselves with the stop, with the, the shotgun house type a little bit more before we see them were able to do that. Um, Katrina, can you talk a little bit more about the ventilation in shotgun houses and sort of um, the ways in which shotgun architecture is um, suited for our environment? Oh, sure. Yeah, shotguns are, are they're perfect for our environment. So you start with if the doors line up, that's going to be key. So you open up your front door, you open up your back door, and you just allow the breezes to happen. Um, then we have 10, 16 foot high ceilings in our houses. So as I said, you know, heat rises. And so, you know, your best bet is to have it rise all the way up there. And you're going to find that in mansions too. I mean, everybody at this time has really high ceilings in New Orleans. Um, then we have floor to ceiling windows. We have transoms. I didn't even mention transoms earlier. You have transoms, which are the door, uh, the windows over the doors. And those used to be adjustable. I mean, you might live in a house, if you're lucky, if you live in a house where your transoms are adjustable, that's really great. Mine are all painted shut. Um, and then everything's raised up on brick piers. And some of that's for flooding, but some of it is for airflow. Um, think about the winter time, guys. If you live in a shotgun house, there's no subfloors, it's drafty. Um, and that is really because most of the time it's hot here. Um, and so the draft is a good thing. It was a good thing. Now it's a little tough with our air conditioning. Um, so someone is also asking if um, shotguns are still being built in New Orleans. You know what? I just saw an Instagram post um, about an Irish Channel shotgun. I can't remember who did it, but they're putting, they're painting <laughs> they're painting the soffit, uh, so the, the porch, they're painting the porch ceiling bright pink. And it's really exciting because they're taking this old type and they're modernizing it, modernizing it up with like hot pink paint. So I, I really enjoy that one. I can't remember who's doing it, um, but I saw it on, face, uh, on Instagram the other day. Yeah, they're still building them. I mean, they're really special architecture pieces. Um, so Katrina, when you, um, you, you went into a little bit of detail about, um, the, um, influx of new residents to New Orleans in 1809 coming from mm -hmm. Saint-Domingue, from Haiti. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about sort of how that influx of population, um, what that, what that sort of looked like and how the uh, that group of people came to be living in New Orleans at that time and um, yeah. how that related to the building of shotguns um, sort of um, were, were the um, Haitian Sandeman immigrants were they um, buying and buying land and building their own homes were they uh, were were shotgun houses being built for that population and um, are shotgun houses a um, type of housing or housing form that you would still find in Haiti today? Gosh, I've never been to Haiti. Um, one of my friends was telling me that, and she's been to Haiti, um, one of my friends was telling me that there are still shotguns down there. Um, she said, but what she said to me, and we were talking about this yesterday because I had told her I was going to do the shotgun talk, and um, she was telling me um, that in a lot of cases, you know, they're really old and they're just not in good shape unless a company takes them over. She was saying, like, if a company happens to be in them, then they're in really good shape. And I think that's kind of interesting. Um, I would love to go to Haiti to just trace our architectural history there, um, but I haven't made it there yet. Um, but yeah, so the Haitian Revolution happened 1790s and um, uh, the Haitians ended up getting their freedom and, and many people left and 10,000 of them ended up in New Orleans in 1809. And, and you got to really think about the time period, right? So the Louisiana Purchase just happened in 1803. We have Americans coming in. They're settling on the upriver side of Canal. You got Haitians showing up. They speak French. The Americans, of course, speak English. Um, so the Creoles you know, the, the Haitians start settling on the Creole side, which is, of course, the downriver side of um, Canal Street. And, you know, the Maroney is just being opened up about then. 
you know, I want to, I'm not entirely sure, but I want to say 1803, 1805, 1809, you know, just that time period, we have this sort of, um, you know, there's a lot of space to, um, for people to settle into. And so they're, they're just buying plots of land and they're setting up these houses. I mean, we have, um, you know, I'm sure among all those people, there were architects. I'm sure, you know, we had free people of color that did all these things. They did architecture. Um, so they just brought their house style with them. And because of the heat, you know, they, they probably got here and was like, yeah, it's hot here. We should do this too. We should do it here as well. So is it a myth that um, the shotgun house form um, and the fact that it was long and skinny had anything to do with, with um, city taxation? Well, no, see that, uh, well, that is a myth. That's a myth because when you find them in rural areas, um, <laughs> it's funny, it seems to me that when people don't really know the answer, they lean on this taxing thing. So they're not really sure, but they're like, I think it's a taxing thing. Um, and we, we haven't ever found that. But when you look in rural areas, you find them in fields. So you'll have nothing around you at all and you'll just have this house. And so it's not about spacing. It's just the way it, the way it is. Um, yeah, it's not about taxing. It's not about how many windows or how many hallways or how many doors inside. I mean, that's, that's not what it, the frontage, that's not it. It's just a really, it's a quick, easy way to build a house. Thank you. Um, so we've had quite a few questions about the layout of shotguns. And so I will, I will say to everyone, we are going, um, as we, we're gonna see different shotguns throughout the next couple of weeks, you'll see a lot of different layouts and be able to sort of see what that floor plan looks like. Obviously um, an original shotgun floor plan, particularly in a single is very, it's, it's somewhat rigid. Uh, there were no hallways. And a lot of the houses that we'll be looking at are doubles that have been converted to singles or um, homes that have been renovated over time and modernized in the interior. Um, and so you'll see non-original floor plans in a lot of these houses. Um, but we do have a few people, Katrina, that would love to hear a little bit more about, um, I think the traditional layout of, of a shotgun house and also sort of how they can be modified. Um, sure. And so, um, Typically, where would you find each of the rooms in, a, in a, an original shotgun floor plan? Uh, was the I think people have noticed the bathroom is often in the back. Can you talk about sort of the kitchen bathroom in the rear um, setup that you see in a lot of um, shotgun houses that uh, have not been renovated in the past few years? Um, and also people are asking about the width of different shotgun houses. So if you could talk a little bit about the, those types of um, details. Sure. Um, yeah, so let me bring you guys back to some of the layouts that I have. Um, that's a double, double the work. Um, so basically, when these were built, you know, if you're talking early, 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 if you're talking 1830s, you know, we don't have running water yet. We don't have kitchens in our houses. We don't have any of that. And so it was really just rooms stacked behind each other. Um, as time went on, you start adding plumbing, you start adding um, kitchens inside, that kind of thing. That's going to change things. Um, typically, you're not going to find anything that tells you this room is a bedroom, this room is a living room. They're very easy to customize yourself. Um, so, you know, each of them would have had a fireplace. You know, each of them would have had, um, you know, you could see that here on this layout. Um, they each would have had a window. Um, so, what I think is interesting about these is, you know, depending on what your, who you live with, will determine how you do your rooms. So uh, if you live with a roommate, typically the roommates are going to take the room on each end. So somebody's bedroom will be at the front door, somebody's bedroom will be in the back door, and then you use the middle rooms as the communal areas, the, the living room, the parlor, whatever. Um, if you live with a spouse, then you're typically going to use, you know, the front room that would otherwise be a bedroom as, you know, an office or you know, a sitting room, and then you have the bedroom, or, you know, you have the bedroom in the back um, with, um, you know, with camelbacks, it's really easy because there's a bedroom upstairs. You don't have to cut through everyone's bedroom. I mean, if you look at this floor plan, you have to cut through a bedroom 
to get anywhere. Um, so you better know a lot about your roommate or you're about to, <laughs> you know? you're really about to, they're really, really tricky. Um, but yeah, there's, there's really nothing that says this room should be the parlor or this room should be anything. And so that's one of the best things about them is they're really flexible. Thank you. Um, can we talk a little bit about colors? This is a great image to sort of bring this up. We see a lot of um, different types of color variations on these shotguns, but are there um, any sort of, is, is there any rhyme or reason to what colors would have been on a particular style of shotgun house or an era of architecture? There would have been, um, there would have been. And if you think about like, um, you know, Vucre Commission. The French Quarter is only allowed a certain amount of colors. Um, so that's definitely something to think about if you buy a Creole cottage down there. You can't, or anything, you can't paint it any color you want. Um, yeah, there would have been color variations. Um, I understand the Victorian ones were sort of, um, you know, neutral in some cases. You know, they had dark greens and dark reds. Um, but these days, you know, anything goes with these. They paint them however they like, and so it's pretty neat. I mean, it, you know, in the Greek Revival era, everything was white, and then as time went on, you, you, you sort of um, rebel against that, and then you do colors, and then the next style comes in, you go back to white again, and so it would depend on where you fall in that sort of, um, in, in that pattern. These days, everyone paints them every color they want. Do you know when shotgun houses started to have um, wide drop siding on the front walls or what era of architecture that was from? Like the one in the bottom picture, the bottom left, that wide drop siding? Yes. Um, I've seen, I've seen that go back as far as um, Greek Revival Italianate transition houses. At least in the garden district, I've seen that siding on I mean, so that would bring us back at least 1850s, but I'm not really entirely sure. I can't think of it on the Greek Revival ones that I know of, but Greek Revival Italianate does have that, or can have that, I guess. Thank you. And um, so uh, looking at the floor plan that you've got there, we see that there are stairs on the sides. Um, so there would have mm -hmm. been an entry, um, a second entry on the side of these particular houses or in, on some of them. Um, someone is specifically asking that they've noticed a few houses that don't have a front door, but a side door that looks original. Um, mm -hmm. is that, does that, would that have been a modification? Would there always have been a door in the a front of the house? Um, or, or, um, could it have been built with no door on the front with the, the original entry being on the side? That's a great question. Um, I think you would have to look at each house individually. Um, you know, I'm giving you guys a basic, you know, a really, really basic overview on this. And then there's always exceptions. You know, I've, I was looking at one, um, just like you're saying, it didn't have a front door at all. It's got two windows and then the side entrance is there. Um, it's, it's just a variation. If I, you know, you'd have to look at it really close to see, like, is there a, you know, can you tell that the window used to be a door somehow? Like, does the porch rise all the way to the, you know, you'd have to really study it um, to see if it had been a door and then they changed it. Um, I think it could be either way. Um, some of them were built just to be different. So they have the door on the side instead. Um, it's not the typical way um, you're going to find it. So it's a variation. You have to really study every particular house you're talking about. Great, thank you. Um, can we talk, uh, we, we only have a couple minutes left, but um, we've gotten a couple of questions about building materials. Mm -hmm. um, some folks are, are, are wanting to know a little bit more about um, what type of flooring would have been used in these, in these shotguns. And I think that that might change um, over the course of um, you know the centuries that shotgun houses have been built, um, but if you know anything about sort of what era um, different types of, of wood flooring would have been common, 
um, someone's interested in that. We also have a great question about barge board and the relationship of um, shotgun houses to the shipping industry in New Orleans. Wow, that's a good question. Um, I don't really know much about flooring. Um, you know, we have wood floors. I know we don't have, you know, some floors. Um, as far as barge board goes, I don't really know much about that either. I mean, I would probably, most that I would say that I know for sure about the shipping would be that those brackets are coming from somewhere. The cast iron is coming from somewhere. Um, I, I don't really know of any cases where barge board is used specifically. Doesn't mean it didn't happen. I just can't think of one off the top of my head. Um, but shipping was, you know, if you wanted, you know, if you wanted this fancy mill work, you were ordering it locally, but you could have gotten it out of a catalog. And if that's the case, then that's a lot of the shipping. Um, you know, cast iron came from so far away. It came from New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore. So if you see this ironwork here on this Italian, Italian bracket one, who knows where that ironwork came from? Thank you. Um, do you happen to know if the center wall in a double shotgun would be um, a load bearing wall? Wow. I know less about the interiors. <laughs> um, I don't know. So in our, in our house, we took a wall down and it wasn't the center wall. And now I can't remember if we, well, you know what? Duh, 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 duh. Tons of people take the middle wall out. Sorry. Sorry, I had to think about it. Um, people take the middle wall out to convert them into double, uh, into singles. So um, you might need to keep some of it, but I know for a fact that people have these expansive two room wide um, front way, you know, front rooms. So you can take some of it out. Yeah, and, and obviously you would need to speak with an, with an architect. Yeah, about. you want to talk to a professional, don't just take the wall out of your house. But it's, it's also important to note, I think, that, um, you know, in, those, in the dividing wall between the two sides of a double, you're going to find um, a lot of historic fireplaces and mantles, and um, that is noteworthy to the architecture. So even where you do see a lot of doubles being opened up as singles, um, a lot of times you'll see that that part is retained. So I'm not an engineer or an architect. I'm not sure um, sort of how that structurally works, but obviously as a preservationist and an, a historic architecture um, enthusiast, uh, the PRC and myself personally would love to see a lot of that retained wherever possible. Um, obviously modernization has to happen, but um, that's, that's part of the double shotgun. It's part of what's there. So I, I, I love seeing renovations where you are aware of, of that double wall sometimes. Um, I think that's, there's, you know, especially when you can keep those old mantles and fireplaces. Yeah, in fact. Um, and I also, um, I, I did want to note, um, someone's sort of bringing this up in the question about the barge board. I think um, mm -hmm. the, uh, Bar barges were were dismantled to use barge board to, to uh, and the wood was then used in um, shotgun construction um, or construction really of any kind during that era right? right so I think it's it's one of the really cool things about it is um, is is going back to sort of the um, the ways that these historic buildings not shotgun specifically has nothing to do with the shape of the building but the building materials that were used during that era are so um, adjusted to our climate. Um, mm -hmm. When you see a house that's built with barge board, obviously that wood was meant to sit in water permanently. So it's going to be just naturally suited to the humid, damp climate that we have here. Um, and so, so much of these houses, we can talk about the style and the shape and the form, but the building materials themselves are such an important part of this. Um, and that's one of the things that the Preservation Resource Center is, is, is really passionate about helping people understand is that new and modern is not always best. Um, there's real inherent value in the building materials that people have. So if you guys have historic homes, um, then the next best thing is really not always better than what you've got there. And, and you know, things like that can be repaired. Barge board is an incredible building material that, um, I mean, that stuff is solid. So it, um, we love old building materials. That's what we do. So, um, if anyone, if, and if anyone out there ever has any questions about your historic building materials and how to treat them, how to repair them, um, 
how to find contractors that can work with them, um, call the PRC. We are a resource. It's in our name. Um, we want to help everyone out there love on their old houses and take care of them. So um, that's what we're here for. We've run over time. So um, I'm going to use that as our, as our time to end. Um, please come virtually visit with us again. Um, like I said, if you have any questions, please reach out to us. Um, you can, um, we're, we're, we're all available, even if we're not in the office. So, so go to prcno.org, um, email us, call us. Um, and hopefully we will see some of you guys next week um, for the first interior tour of our, on our virtual shotgun house tour. Um, thank you again to Entablature Design Build and Entablature Realty for um, presenting the tour. Thank you again, Katrina, um, New oh, Orleans, thank you. for doing this. And we will see you guys next week. Bye, everybody.